All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our BCBA task list series, where we are going through each task together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Today, we're continuing with B, Concepts and Principles, specifically B7, Automatic and Socially Mediated Contingencies. Now, this isn't a very dense topic. We're mainly going to focus on automatic because most of what we do as practitioners is obviously socially mediated, right? When we're working with clients and setting up contingencies and antecedents and consequences, it's typically socially mediated. So there's not too much to think about in terms of socially mediated contingencies. What we'll talk about is automatic contingencies a little bit, and then social and non-social antecedents and consequences. So as always, check out behavioranalyststudy.com for our study materials, including our combo pack, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. All right. Examples of automatic and socially mediated contingencies. So automatic contingencies, immediately you should think about functions, right? One of our functions is automatic, sometimes called sensory, more commonly known as sensory today. All automatic means essentially is alone, okay? Behavior is evoked, shaped, maintained, weakened increased by variables without direct manipulation by other people. Simply put, it's non-social, okay? And you can see that non-social contingencies, non-social interactions can change behavior, can evoke it, can shape it, maintain it. So everything that socially mediated contingencies can do, automatic contingencies can do as well. And we'll talk about why automatic contingencies are sometimes harder to deal with, especially when we talk about things like self-stimulatory behaviors. But at the core, all we mean when we say automatic is, is really alone, right? And this, is, this doesn't mean you're not around other people. It just means everything that's happening, your contingencies, your antecedents, your consequences, they're not being done or driven or mediated by other people. And then socially mediated, right, is clearly an antecedent or consequences consequence presented by another person. This is just social, all right? And this is what we deal with in practice most of the time, okay? We're we're setting up contingencies that are socially mediated. Most of our functions tend to be socially mediated, okay, which we'll talk about in our question. Finally, stimuli can be non-social, a red light, or social, your friend asking you a question. So which of the following functions of behavior is primarily socially mediated? Now, you could consider really tangible escape and attention, socially mediated, right? Because we have an entire function dedicated to automatic. But at the end of the day, there's there are times when you might obtain a tangible uh, through automatic means, right? If you're shopping alone at the store and you're picking out clothes, well, you're selecting clothes automatically, right? Or if you're making yourself a meal or anytime you're just doing something by yourself, it's really... Some, somewhat of an automatic contingency, right? So although tangible escape and attention are often socially mediated, really the one that's primarily is attention, right? And, and why is that? Well, for what should be, I think, obvious reasons. Attention is driven by gaining the attention of others, okay? You're trying to get the attention of somebody in your social environment. You can escape, right, uh, in an automatic fashion if there's nobody else around. If you're driving in the car and uh, a song you don't like comes on, you change the song and you've escaped. Okay. So yes, tangible escape and attention are, are often associated with socially mediated uh, contingencies. Attention though is really the true function that is, is more often than not, almost 99% of the time, if not a hundred going to be socially mediated. So automatic reinforcement. Reinforcement without social mediation, okay? Sensory consequences that sound good, look good, taste good, smell good, feel good. And this is why automatic reinforcement and automatic is, is often referred to as sensory. And automatic and sensory, same thing, okay? Especially uh, when training RBTs and new RBTs, a lot of the RBTs trainings now just use sensory, which is, I think, a mistake. We should be aware of the the jargon and the technical term, which is automatic, okay? Because sensory can mean a lot of other things as well. So if you're going to use sensory to describe the function, you need to be very clear on what you mean. What you're saying is the function is not socially mediated. 
Okay. So again, if you're going to describe a behavior and say it's sensory, what you're saying is it's not socially mediated. All the time, people make the mistake where a child, let's say, uh, will rub up against someone's clothing, right? Another person's arms or legs or sweatshirts or whatever. And people will say, oh, that's just sensory. Well, it's not because there's another person involved, okay? And if they're only rubbing up on that sweater when it's on a person, then it's not automatic, okay? It's still socially mediated as being delivered by another person. You just need to be very careful with your wording. Sensory is thrown around a lot, misused quite often. That being said, automatic and sensory are typically interchangeable. And a good way to remember, okay, what what are some contingencies that are automatic? Well, do they sound good? Do they look good? Do they taste good? Do they smell good? Do they feel good? Are they affecting your internal senses, right? And we're not getting too mentalistic here, but it's a good way to remember things in our environment that just affect us, okay, can be automatic, right? A song you like, uh, you like it, you like a painting, the food you eat, uh, flowers smell good, and again, you rub something that feels good, a texture feels good, okay? So not a complex topic, but you can really think hard about it and come to start to better understand what we mean when we say, well, this is a sensory behavior. And you'll get better at identifying uh, the function of the behavior when we don't jump automatically to just automatic reinforcement. It's a big mistake behavior analysts, new behavior analysts, analysts make is they jump to conclusions about automatic reinforcement too quickly. Okay, it's a big error. Now, also, this is one way. Two is behavior persist without a known reinforcer. So if we have no idea why behavior is persisting, okay, we tend, and if, if you think about a functional analysis and you've got your data and it, your data is all overlapping, we, what we typically say, we're just going to lean on the side of automatic reinforcement. If we're not sure what the reinforcer is, we tend to think, okay, this is some sort of sensory automatic reinforcement. There's something in the environment that's not being mediated, maybe something internally that's persisting or causing the behavior to persist that we can't see. Question, which of the following examples would likely not produce automatic reinforcement? Okay, we're looking for something that's not going to produce automatic reinforcement. In other words, you need to find the answer that's socially mediated. So A, you bite into an apple. Well, if you bite into an apple, that's going to taste good, and it's not going to be socially mediated. A child flaps their hands, very common, right? It might feel good, okay? You put on your favorite sweater, again, it might feel good. It, the sweater might smell good, right? And again, not socially mediated. But if you see your friend in the hallway, there's a second person involved, okay? There's a social aspect to it, and it's not going to likely produce automatic reinforcement. Even, let's say, it feels good to see your friend, right? Still socially mediated because there's a, another person involved. Now, let's talk about non-social, social, or combinations of antecedents and consequence events, okay? And we don't talk about this a lot in practice because it's not always that useful to, to identify non-social and social uh, consequences, but it's important to think a little bit about this, okay? So a non-social antecedent might be a vending machine, right? Our response is we put money in, and then we get the snack, which is non-social. So this is pretty automatic, okay? What about an alarm clock? Well, again, non-social, we wake up, and then the wife says good morning, okay? So the function you know, could be attention, um, could be automatic if we're just waking up and the wife says good morning, it could be dual functioned. But the point is, we've got a non-social antecedent, but a social consequence. And then we pay the cashier, which is social, we receive food, right? And then we eat our meal, which could be either non-social or social, depending on our context, okay? Typically, eating a meal is going to be non-social, right? If you're just eating by yourself, but if it's social, it could be social. Again, this is why this doesn't tell you a whole lot about anything, okay? The first one is a good indication that's going to be automatic reinforcement because there's there's no social aspect in play, 
Okay. But these other are, are a little more vague, right? Obviously, if we're paying the cashier or receiving the food and we eat our meal, if the consequence is eating the meal and feeling full, well, that might be automatic, right? Because it, it feels good. It's not socially mediated. We're, we're feeling full. We're eating our meal. Okay. So don't think too much about this. It's just an important thing to, I think, point out because it is part of this idea of automatic and socially mediated contingencies. And then finally, what to remember about automatic reinforcement. Again, I said we weren't going to do too much on socially mediated contingencies because those are the obvious ones. Typically, it's going to be our three functions of attention, tangible, and escape. Okay, and we'll, we'll put those on extinction in some sort of socially mediated fashion or we'll reinforce in some sort of socially mediated fashion. It's the most common idea. Automatic is much more difficult to deal with and to think about and to diagnose. So what do we remember? Reinforcement isn't always planned or socially mediated. What often happens is kids will start getting reinforced from their environment and we can't even tell. And so we're not sure what's maintaining the behavior. We know we aren't, nothing we're doing. That automatic reinforcement's pretty difficult. Even more difficult when that automatic reinforcement is coming from sort of some sort of internal stimulation, smell, touch, feeling, senses, that kind of thing. Behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement may be resistant to planned ignoring, timeout, and extinction. Timeout's a big one, right? Because if you put a kid who's being automatically reinforced in timeout, well, we're not really withholding reinforcement if it's some internal sense that's reinforcing, right? Extinction is very difficult uh, because for extinction to work, we need to somehow withhold the sensory feeling, so to speak, of this automatic reinforcement. So behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement is, is often very difficult to deal with. Labeling something automatic too quickly is a common mistake. This is one of my biggest pet peeves and things I see all the time is we just want to relabel everything automatic. And if we think about this, okay, once you label something automatic, you really put yourself in a tough position. And why is that? Well, because it's a lot harder to deal with automatic reinforcement than it is the the other three functions. So you really want to make sure your FBAs are dialed in and you rule out every other possible scenario before we jump to automatic. The automatic is just much more difficult to handle. And then a socially mediated reinforcement isn't available, consider automatic. Most obvious one, when kids are alone and they're engaging in behavior, that's a a, often a, a, a sign pointing towards automatic, right? Um, when kids are have everything they want and they're not looking to escape from anything and they're not looking to gain attention and they're still engaging in some sort of behavior, again, consider automatic. So this could go the other way. If socially mediated reinforcement isn't available or if they're completely overwhelmed or they have all the socially mediated reinforcement they could want and they're still engaging, then maybe consider automatic. Okay, kind of a, a, a different type of topic to talk about. All right, it's not as clear cut. Um, it's much more theoretical um, and it's much more applicable because it applies to so many things, right? FBAs, FAs, uh, reinforcement procedures, extinction procedures, punishment procedures, differential reinforcement, the list goes on and on identifying uh, automatic and socially mediated contingencies are really part of the building blocks of everything else. And as we go th through concepts and principles, that's what we're doing, right? We're establishing fundamentals. We're establishing building, building blocks. So when we get to, when we get deeper in the task list, okay, we'll be more prepared to talk about those on a more advanced level. As always, like and subscribe for all of our updates. We do these BCBA task list series every Sunday. We also have our exam reviews on Friday and our questions on Saturday. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. As always, work hard, study hard. See you soon.